Hi, I'm Hamo Forsyth. I'm the executive producer of Apple's new docu-series, Becoming You. And you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm the director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today we're talking to Hamo Forsyth. He's the executive producer of Becoming You on Apple TV+, Plus, which is a extraordinary documentary series that um, basically tells the story of the first 2,000 days of a newborn's life. So from birth to about five years old, what happens in that time period in human life? And they chronicle kids across the entire world. So it has everything. It has, you know, the, the hopefulness of the human race. It's extremely interesting because so much happens to you as you grow in those first 2,000 years, uh, 2,000 years, 2,000 days. And then also, it is it shot across the world in with stunning, stunning cinematography. We actually talk a lot about that because this is shot and produced completely different from what your expectation of documentary is. So this is a show not to miss. It's called Becoming You. It's on Apple TV Plus, and it's available right now. And we talked to Hamo Forsyth all about it. So I'm here with Hamo Forsyth. He is the executive producer of Becoming You on Apple TV Plus. And so excited to have you here. Hamo, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Um, I'm glad that you, you're interested in the series and that we have a chance to talk about it. Well, it's a fascinating series covering something that, you know, I don't think has ever really been done before. Let's bring the audience up to speed. What is Becoming You? Okay, so it's a six-part uh, docu-series for Apple, um, and it's sort of like a natural history type approach to the, looking at the first 2,000 days of human life and really how um, a very vulnerable newborn animal, for want of a better word, <laughs> in a newborn baby, transforms in, over the process of over the course of 2000 days into a sort of, you know, a fully functioning human being as we know it. So I suppose if you think about 2000 days being about five, five years and something, it's probably when as a parent, you first drop your child off at school. And you imagine that child going into school, being a fully fledged talking, walking, um, socializing, emoting human being. And, and really, it's, it's sort of like, how do you get there in that period of time? I mean, it, it is the most extraordinary from a scientific point of view. Um, it's the most extraordinarily uh, fast uh, period of growth that any any animal or any human goes through. So for the rest of your life, you're developing at a far, far slower rate than during that period of time. I, the, following the story of the kids is fascinating in and of itself. But in addition to that, you have absolutely stunning cinematography across the entire world and an opportunity to learn about different cultures like this. Yeah, it it really has it all. It, it, it was funny. I was watching it and I'm like, this is Anthony Bourdain parts of no parts unknown. But instead of food, it's kids. <laughs> like, yeah, it really, Like that is really what the show is. It's it's absolutely fascinating. Exactly. I mean, I think the kids are just a sort of, you know, obviously they 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 deliver the goods in terms of what are we looking at here from a developmental point of view? Yeah. And if we capture that, that's great. But as you say, there's, there's all the wrapping that comes with that. I mean, I've never, I, you know, the last time I, was, I, I saw inside a monastery in Himalayas was, you know, the last emperor. And, you know, I, I was sort of, it was, very, that was a very cinemat cinematographic moment. And, and I thought this is a perfect opportunity to sort of do that, but in real life. So let's really swing for the fences and, you know, go for some really amazing locations around the world. You know, the, the casting wasn't just casting kids. It was casting planet Earth. You know, Apple set us the project. So said, make this global. You know, sometimes commissioners say to you, make this global. And what they mean is film it in London and get somebody in Paris to do something on their iPhone. And that's <laughs> a global kind of approach. But what was nice about working with the streamer Apple was that, you know, they had the clout to actually allow us to go do that and be as ambitious as we wanted to be. So, you know, we were in 10 plus countries, um, six different states in the States, uh, 100 plus children. You know, we ended up filming with about 140 children in the end. 
Um, so really, we didn't hold back. And yes, it delivers on an anthropological point of view, uh, a sort of armchair travel point of view, um, and is is stunning to look at. I mean, we, you know, we had to abandon our kind of documentary muscle memory when it came to the visuals because each each little story had to look like a, a proper little drama, you know. And that's from a technical point of view, filming something like this as a sort of you know in a cinematographic way is incredibly ambitious. You know, you, you you've got to get all around the world. You've got to be relatively discreet with these kids in order to get the right sort of behavior out of them. And doing that, but doing that at this level was, was, was a real challenge, but, but also, you know, very rewarding. Yeah. What was the casting process like? It was really difficult. I mean, as ever, we completely underestimated how, how difficult it would be. Um, um, But we, you know, we persevered. We ended up having one center of casting in London and one in New York um, and they did the sort of low hanging fruit, if you like. They they went for the the, the more sort of you know the English speaking families who were accessible through parents groups and schools and educational facilities and things like that. And they did the sort of traditional kind of outreach, looking for what we were after. Um, and the, for the more sort of far flung places, we used fixers principally to go into these areas and meet the families. And we told them what we were looking for. And they sort of came back with a checklist and, 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 and some footage. Um, and and we, we remotely looked at that. But we, 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 we always kept it very broad. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we anticipated that when directors went out to distant places, they would probably find kids that were better than the ones the fixers had found. Um, or that the ones that they found weren't doing what we thought they were going to be doing. So, you know, we needed to keep an open mind about that. And there was quite a bit of, um, you know, l- late casting in that respect, if, if things weren't quite what we expected when we got there. Mm. So it was a sort of mixture of traditional and and, um, and slightly Heath Robinson kind of casting. Um, in terms of, you know, what the developmental steps were, um, that was all about working with the experts. We had a panel of experts on the show who helped us navigate the the science of it, um, i.e., you know, what are the things developmentally that we can't miss? You know, what, 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 what do we need to include in this series in order for it not to be, you know, in, in order for it not to not deliver? And they were very clear about that. But, you know, when those two entities meet, there's always a bit of a tug of war because, you know, things that might be really fascinating to a scientist might be really quite boring from a tv point of view because you can't actually see it happening yeah. and i and, and one of the sort of cardinal rules with this was we have to be able to see the behavior it's got to be a sort of show and tell we can't just have cute pictures of babies you know wriggling around on blankets and say there's all this incredible stuff going on inside their brains because it just didn't really translate and i think we would have short changed the audience so we tended to sort of go through the baby bit relatively quickly and get to the slightly more involved toddlers, you know, or the slightly older children who were displaying behavior in a much more evident way. Um, not not to say that babies aren't interesting, and they're, they're, uh, 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 but they're very, cute, they're very cute and everything. But, you know, it, it was just about agreeing with them what we could and couldn't put in and what we couldn't really show from a photographic point of view. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that was a very difficult process, you know, because sometimes we didn't really know what we were looking for or how we were going to, you know, how we were going to find that, how we were going to create it pictorially and and, and discover it. But, um, you know, we got there in the end. Well, can you give us an example of something that you didn't think you were able to show that you ultimately were able to? One thing, for example, is, you know, when, when, when a baby is born in terms of what they see and what they and, and what they actually see and hear in the world in terms of their senses, they have this sort of they, they go through a they go through a sort of period which which has been likened to a kind of LSD trip by by lots of different scientists. So you're sort of like, well, okay, we, we let's have a stab at that, you know, but let, it might not work. So you know, we we just use very sort of special camera work at a point of birth going back to a house. And this all was actually filmed in a refugee camp in Jordan next to the Syrian border. So even tougher place to do it. But it was really like, how, how do we, you know, try and create that world? Because it's such an important message to get across. You know, they don't, babies don't really know whether what they're smelling is what they're seeing or what they're seeing is what they're hearing. And it's all a big jumble um, to begin with until they start, until their brain starts to really process what, you know, what they're seeing and hearing. 
Um, so that's an example of something that, you know, we, we could easily have sort of not got. I mean, what we needed to go and get was the birth and the newborn, but the other stuff to add on without that working, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked. But, you know, luckily it did, you know, without being too sort of weird or, 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 or funky, you know, yeah. and I mean, the other thing, the other thing was sort of imaginary friends, you know, how do you, how do you tell the story of imaginary friends, which is very important with kids um, without sort of doing special effects. And, and, and we thought about ways of doing it, but then we decided we're going to have to do some special effects. So, it's a bit unlike the rest of the series, but there's one lovely scene um, in socialization where, where where this boy has a has a has a friend who follows him around, and he was created in digital effects. Mm. And, and that, in normal situations, could be quite a departure from kind of the tone and vibe of the series. But I think you guys did a great job of keeping consistency throughout. I think so. And, and, and as you know, you don't really know that until you get in the edit and start putting everything together. Um, but we were very careful to test our style with the camera, et cetera, before we went out and shot anything proper. I mean, we, you know, we really uh, agonized over what the camera kit was going to be. We did test shoots that were slightly more kind of handheld, that felt a bit more observational in terms of the documentary style. Um, but it didn't really work. You know, what we realized is we, we needed everything on sort of gimbals and sticks and low angles with the kids up close, you know, with those children, intimate with them in order to see what was going on and hear what was going on in their in, in their world. So we, we, we sort of established a visual style with that over a period of time that meant that no director or crew went out without knowing what they were going, you know, what and how they were going to do it. You know, you could have easily have sent out five different directors and they would have come out, come back with absolutely five different experiences. Um, but we, we, you know, we couldn't do that. You know, this had to feel like a homogenized series and it all had to look beautiful. So did you have kind of one core director of photography that you worked with to develop the look? Yeah, we had well, we had a series director, and he worked closely with a director of photography um, that he'd worked with a lot. Um, and they spent a lot of time in London and disappearing off to various families, um, you know, with kit from Panavision, experimenting with new stuff. Mm. Um, and uh, they absolutely established what you know what what boxes we needed to take, where we needed to take them, and and, and they sort of they kind of nailed this kind of I, I, I call it almost like a Tom and Jerry sort of approach where. You go into a house and everything happens down there. You know, that's where kids, but, but that's where they do stuff. So let's forget about mum and dad. You know, you can easily sort of try and be pointy headed and say, look, parents, let's all gather around and have a look at these wonderful kids. But it was much more fun to get down on the rug and be right next to the kid and throw all the parents out of focus. You know, and for, for the longest period of time, you know, we only we, with parents, we'd only really see the legs, which is a very a real Tom and Jerry thing. You know, um, and we found it very effective, actually, because it, it gave you an intimacy and a, and a proximity to the child that made you feel like you were actually luckier than the parent. You know, you were seeing stuff that they were missing. And that was a very special uh, sort of part of the ingredient, I think, in order, you know, that, that, that they managed to, to kind of zero in on early on. But it, but it was a it was a process of, of trial and error, as it always is with these things. But again, the nice thing about working with Apple um, was that you know the, the the ambition of the project allowed us to do that, and it allowed us to work with them early on on what was and what wasn't going to fly in terms of how how the thing looked and felt. Did they have any pushback at all? Yeah, I think you know I I, I think they were very sort of clear about up, you know upping upping the quality of how it looked all the time. Yeah. You know, um, and you know in, in the world of documentary. That's not always the conversation you're having with the, with the commissioners. You know, it's story, 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 story. But here it was story, 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 and quality, 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 quality. Yeah. You know, so it was a marriage of different worlds, really. You know, we, we didn't go out and get our buddies from the docks world to come and shoot this stuff. You know, we got people who'd done commercials and, and features because they could get that look. And they yeah. worked with producers who were much more doxy producers. And it was a kind of, you know, it was it was a real meeting of, of of minds. But but in TV, you have to do that. You know, you don't you you don't get PBS to do a Friday night entertainment show because they're going to get it wrong. Even if even if you give them all the budget in the world, you know, it's just not how it works. In the, in the, in the same way that you know news don't make drama. Um, you and and sometimes you have to just accept that and go out 
looking for the best people from those, you know, from those disciplines. And I think increasingly television is like that. It's like, where are the best people to come on in and help us with this? Where do we get them from? Um, and, and that's a mark that the thing is changing to a degree, I think. That's a really interesting concept that you just threw out there because I, I wasn't thinking about it in those terms, but you're right. I mean, if the demands are such that you need the highest quality possible, but traditionally in documentary, it's story first, quality, you know, second in a way. Um, yeah. That for you as an executive producer, how did you react to that challenge? I mean, was that something that was frustrating to you at the beginning? Not really, because I think I like I like the idea of it. I, I thought this is something that no one's done. Mm. You know, nobody has nobody has gone out to shoot documentary with kit like this. You know, with with an ambition like this. So let's see if it can be done. So it's I, from that perspective, it's definitely groundbreaking. But it was a bit terrifying. Yeah, I don't think I was ever annoyed. I was just terrified by the prospect of it. <laughs> and you got to hide that and just crack on. You know, I can see a lot of frustrations just for. You know, cinematographers that are used to commercials and film are they're just their their skill set is different than documentary. Yeah. It's different. Like they're they're used to having things be able to be performed multiple times. They're they just are used yeah. to a different workflow. I mean, uh, yeah. how how did the cinematographers react to this new challenge? I mean, where there must have been some well, give and take. Well, a lot of them had you know had worked with children, you know, and were quite used to actually work, working with kids either in the kind of commercial sphere or or elsewhere so they knew what they were sort of walking into and you know we would never have sent out you know a sort of uh, big hairy crew who 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 never worked with with little ones before because you would have absolutely had that problem but i think from the outset um from the outset uh, people people were prepared for what was coming and the other thing that we did was you know we worked out you know, the, we 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 work with the experts and we work with the families to say what 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 is the child doing that displays this behaviour, and how can we when we get there zero in on that and get that behaviour and then build the other stuff around it because once we've once we've got the thing that we want to really tell, then we can go and make the place look amazing and the rest of it. But you can have any number of aerials, and beautiful shots of villages. But if you don't actually get that moment, then, you know, so that's that moment was where we really spent the patience, you know, and that was about filming a child, you know, on one angle with this incredible kit, following them with gimbals so everything you could go with them to a degree um, and keep the quality going, um, lock off on sticks, you know, go on long lenses, give them peace and quiet. But it was a waiting game, as it would be in a sort of natural history project you know you're waiting for the eagle to to come down and eat the hair you know and and and, and that's a, a lot a lot of this project was like that and, and at the moment that we got that off we off we go and get the rest of it the packaging yeah what camera package did you end up deciding on i know you did some testing you had mentioned earlier what did you go with uh well we wanted i mean at first it says we wanted to shoot large format so I don't, and i think we're probably the first doc ever to to, to make that decision. You are really giving yourself a lot of hurdles to overcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think the first camera we tried was a Venice. Um, but it didn't, there was something about the Venice that didn't co-work with other elements of kit that we needed. Mm. Um, so we ended up use, using a, a, a Red Monstro um, w with just incredible lenses from Panavision and, and, uh, and Prime. Um, and yeah, just all this just sort of amazing kit that that so as I said, gimbals and we we had we, we, you know we had these devices that would go a full three sixty so that you could follow a child rolling over, for example, uh, follow the entire thing. Um, but that was that was essentially the package. But it you know the, the yeah red red monstros and eight uh, K um, large large format um, and lovely lenses. Can you talk to us about the lighting for these shoots? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what we really wanted to go for was as much natural light as possible. And a lot of the shooting was outside, as you'll see in the in the, in the project, um, because that also gave us a chance to film the place. You know, if you, you, you really felt a bit claustrophobic when you filmed too many interiors on this. You wanted to be out there. So if you're in Cape Town, you know, go to the beach 
film on the beach, don't film in the apartment. Apart from certain things that you obviously had to do at home if they were kind of home-based stories. So we got out as much as we did as we could, which meant that we had levels of natural light that this kit could really work well with um, and provide the look we were after mm. without any kind of interference. Uh, and then, of course, with you know, with some interiors, they needed a bit of help, but it was never, never the lighting was never a major concern. In the in the natural light scenarios, did you have um, people holding flex fills and bounce cards and things to just kind of manage that uh, yeah, light? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, chuck it where it needs to go if it's not shining there. Yeah, but not you know, but but always using that natural light as much as you know to 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 the degree that was possible. What was the what were the crews like at each location? Not massive because we you know there were lots of boxes, but we tried to keep the people to a to a minimum, and we pick up a lot of local help you know where where we needed to carry lots of stuff uh, as much as possible. So really, I mean, from from the UK, we'd be dispatching um, a, you know a DOP sound, a producer, a field producer, and a director um, and a dip probably so you know five or six people and then they'd pick up the rest when they were there but we all we just made sure that people would work in such a way that we weren't ever flooding a family's life with with, with you know with with too many people um so keep it you know keep it as small as possible no catering trucks you know no you know hide as much of the kit as possible um and try and keep keep pretty discreet you know as i said it's it was crucial in the way that that we interacted with the families that we did, you know, they didn't feel like Hollywood was coming to town. Did you send out any second units for um, the environmental shots or the scenes that don't necessarily have our characters in them? Um, the only times that we sort of went back and shot later was were a few kind of aerials and, and, and things like that where, where, where we were waiting for permits or, or the correct kind of weather and things like that. Uh, but um, on the whole, we, we mopped everything up as we went. Um, but in a situation where we hadn't, got the behavior that we wanted to get first time round. we did dispatch the crews again to go back to some of these places and, and, um, you know, and, and, and get the behavior there. But having said that, we were pretty lucky because we scheduled in a certain way that we would have, let's say a four to five week shoot um, and a number of children to film within that, within sort of relatively close proximity. But it meant that if you arrived on day one and child A wasn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, there's a high chance they might be doing it mid-shoot or at the end. So we just had to be changeable, malleable in that sense. And it meant that we had enough scope, if we were fluid and flexible, to pick off the bits we needed to get as and when we needed them. But there was a lot of kind of phone calls saying, he's doing it, he's doing it, you know. <laughs> and trying to work out what the priority was, you know. Were the directors selected per episode like did you have one director one crew per episode or a director and crew per location how did you break it up well we, we divided it in locations in the end because to do it any other way would have been too too uh just unachievable you know obviously you want to be able to say to a director have your own app and they all they all like to you know they all respond to that well but it wouldn't have been possible given that we wanted to in each episode really dance around the globe we had to say, look, guys, this is a collegiate approach. Mm. You'll be shooting stuff that will appear in, in multiple episodes. Um, and, you know, that's also why what you're doing needs to sort of look the same as, you know, what we put down on the rubric. And it worked really well. I think in the end, people were, were delighted to work that way. And it meant that there was a sort of, it really helped us to give that glue across the series, um, uh, you know, because people were working for the same him sheet ultimately they knew they were getting stuff that was going to go across different apps uh, i don't think it could have been done any other way um it would have yeah just been a bit too punishing i think in, in order you know just to get one crew into one remote part of the world it's hard enough without getting multiple different crews in there just from a permits point of view you know so becoming you features a, a whole variety of children and families across the globe how much time are you spending on average with each character to film them? Well, um, it's a really good question. I think it depends on it depends on what 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 behaviour we're after. But we could probably get what we needed from that that particular family within a week of within a week of shooting. Mm. 
um, but no, with the knowledge that we could return if we needed to get some, you know, so, 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 some extra bits or if a child became unwell and we couldn't film with them, you know, or whatever reason. I mean, as you, you know, filming with kids is really hard as well because there are lots of strictures about how many hours you can film for and the licenses around the world vary wildly. Mm. Some places don't even have licenses and you have to sort of bring your own rule book with you um, and have chaperones to watch and make sure you're not, you know, nap, nap time is it becomes your sort of nemesis, you know, <laughs> because yeah. you've got a, a checklist this big and a, and a little one that needs, needs needs naps. And there's someone saying that child needs a nap. You know, like, fine. You yeah, know, that's fine. Checklist. <laughs> I've dealt with that a couple of times. <laughs> I've had the yeah. I've had I've had the pleasure of working with kids a, a few times now directing them and it's like it the, the cuteness goes away real fast when you have like <laughs> two hours left and you realize you got a break for a nap you're like oh my god I can't That's take right. it anymore it it That's just right. you really have to put any semblance of control that you think you have as a director kind of goes out the window when you're dealing with kids and pets at least what I found I'm sure no, it's the same right. for you. That's right. And, and and people would say to me, like, you know, when we were staffing up, like, what what qualities do we need in you know, in, in producers and people out in the field? I said, just get Mary Poppins. You need Mary Poppins. <laughs> you know, you need somebody who will just smile and do whatever it takes and keep the parents happy and keep those kids happy and keep the crew happy. You know, it's just it, it, the it, it, they're hard to find, but they're there. <laughs> What would you say was the biggest challenge of the entire series? Anything come to mind that was just completely unexpected, completely difficult, something you're, you know, proud of for overcoming? I mean, I, I think, you know, making any kind of television in 2020, the compliance levels, as you know, just, you'll know, you've got your own production company, the, 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 the number of things you have to think about and the number of things you have to get right and the number of things you cannot do and the number, you know, it, it, it is becoming such a huge burden on production. Yeah. The background checking, the, uh, you know, the licensing, uh, the health and safety. I mean, it's all obviously very important. But on a project like this, where you've, where you've elected to go around the world and, you know, film in monasteries and, you know, I mean, the the... the the, the level of compliance and getting the rules right just goes from being a little bit tricky to a to a huge game of three dimensional chess, and that I think I'm so proud of the team on this to have you know allowed us to go out and do what we've done within all the parameters of the law and and you know making sure that every child had naps. And making sure that everybody, you know, everybody was checked and all of the things you had to do, but in a nice way too, you know, without alienating the families. And, with, you know, I mean, the thing about documentary is, as you know, you know, you don't pay people to be in documentaries. You rely on their goodwill and their time and their interest, yeah. you know. But when you start to apply the same level of compliance that you would for a feature film where you're paying an actor millions of pounds, and you're demanding that of a small family somewhere, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's really tricky. And I can understand why it happens, but it, it you know, to, to this, that really did surprise me at quite how how tricky it's got. You know, we've been getting used to it, but I think, I, you know, I've gone from a, a world where I was working largely in the UK, you know, with difficult organisations like the police force and the National Health Service, you know, so very difficult stuff to do from a compliance perspective. But the sheer myriad of things that came up because of all of our locations and all of our children was, yeah, it was immense. I mean, and then we had the usual things like typhoons in Japan and, you know, the Rugby World Cup and no hotel rooms and oh my God. Uh, a camera froze in Mongolia in a place that was five days away from London. Oh. I mean, I didn't know. I, when, they, when, when they told me how long it was going to take them to get to, I, thought, I, I said, you're joking. I mean, I think, doesn't it take that long to get to Saturn? <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I actually didn't know there was still there was still a place on Earth that took five days to get to. Why? But but they found it. Well, because they had to. It, it was sort of right on the border between Mongolia and Russia, right up at the top where the reindeer herders are. And, you know, they had to go via Ulaanbaatar and then across cross country for four days. 
Oh my god! You know, some of it on horseback with all the kit, oh and then my the camera. God! Thing. So That's somebody from crazy. London had to go out with a with a second camera and, and and deliver that. So you had to ride horseback to get to some of these. To, well, at least yeah. one of these locations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine the that there wasn't an airstrip somewhere or a heli access to a helicopter or something or like. No, there was in, in Mongolia. There was, I think, there was an opportunity perhaps to to get in a plane to come back, but it was sort of at that point felt, you know, sort of nonsensical, um, and also it was sort of prohibitively um, expensive to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we, you know, we looked at all the options, helicopters, the whole deal, but no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't happening. So horseback it was. And uh, I remember talking to the, they, they have satellite phone. It would only work for like 20 seconds at a time. So you'd have a whole conversation, but just in 20 second nuggets. Um, so there were no pleasantries by the end of the conversation. It was just like picking up where you left off. But I'd never, I'd, you know, I'm like, you, you expect your crew to arrive fresh, you know, off the airplane or whatever and get going. But these guys were just exhausted by the time they got there. So, oh my God. you know, just had to sleep in yurts for a little while to get to get back their you know, energy levels back up. So what happened with the camera? It froze. And then how did you what did you do? We We sent another one out there. And, uh, you know, we just needed to extend that sh that particular that particular sleep um, shoot. Wow. So, yeah, we got somebody to go. Somebody went halfway back, so it wasn't going to take five days. It would take, you know, it would take two and a half or whatever, whatever calculation we made. And it was a handover of a very expensive camera somewhere, you know, underneath an ice cap somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is an insane story. Yeah, no, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. What and was the get, shot? You know, what was the shot you were getting, or the the story you were getting out there? It, it was the it was the little it was the amazing little uh, amazing little kids in in, in this uh, the Zartan region of northern Mongolia, and they they work in they work in uh, nomadic reindeer herding tribes. That's where they belong. They're, they're born into them, and the story we were telling was. It was about this young girl who was just at that age where children start to look beyond, you know, from in, in a socialization point of view, they start to realize that the sort of life beyond the family unit and that they can start asking friends for help and things like that. And they have this sort of moment of realization where they realize that you can actually get a lot more done if there are, if there are a few of you or if there's more than one of you. So you go from being massively selfish and sort of home dwelling to, to having this sort of different approach to the world and, and and in this particular community they get kids to help really early on because they have to mm. so you've got you know you've got three-year-olds wielding axes and chopping wood and tying up reindeer in in minus 25 and you know that sort of thing and, and but they're genuinely helping they're not just chores you know these kids are genuinely helping and and we, we filmed this lovely scene where um the daughter is sent out to get snow for the evening meal when they when they've recamped, and she goes up on a hill. And it's really hard, and 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 getting you know, snow we, for a meal. Yeah, just to, to melt the snow for the water to cook the meal. Oh, you know? oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not just a meal of snow. <laughs> that would be. I mean, we could open one in New York and see how it goes. You know? Exactly. Throw some flavoring on it. Sell them for yeah. eight bucks each. Yeah, yeah. We I think we could be on something there. Um, uh, uh, so, so yeah, and it, but what she naturally did at this point, because she was starting to really forge these these friendships, was she just went and got friends, um, you know, and uh, and they they did this task together and started doing all sorts of stuff just together, which was incredible and uh, and, and 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 really cute, and then just that message that you know together we're stronger, you know, is is very apparent in that particular scene, and we were also there, we were filming. Uh, for the for, for the um, movement episode, we're filming a boy as he, you know, he, he is one of these tribes when his father is a reindeer herder and his father rides the reindeer. And the time has come for him to learn how to ride a reindeer. Um, and in the sort of physical development of a child, there's a point at which they start to learn how to sequence motions to do more elaborate motions. And once they've crawled and walked, you know, you need to say, okay, in order to get on that horse or on that reindeer, I need to do this, then that, then that, and then this. And you learn this sort of the, uh, motion sequencing. And it was a really nice way to illustrate that, to watch this boy 
trying to get on the back of a reindeer for the first time. And he just couldn't do it for a couple of days mm. until he clocked that, you know, he could map it out in his head and then do it. And it's a real sort of Everest moment. You know, this this little fella gets on the saddle finally and he's pleased as punch. And so is the reindeer, by the way, because he's been throwing himself at this reindeer for days. <laughs> and it's very funny. Every, every time he hits the reindeer, the reindeer goes, <laughs> and um, yeah, and so so. Those, those were two of the stories we did there. Um, and yeah, but it's just a bit of a hold up, you know, because of the camera. But these things happen. And then after that, we, you know, we had a we had a, um, a standby camera on all of the remote shoots. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's Which, a lesson you learn once and then you don't yeah. have to worry about it again. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> He's exactly. spoken like a true executive producer right there. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> what happened? Exactly. All right. You're getting two cameras from now on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did you have any families that just bailed out, you know, that said, yes, they're going to do it. Then all of a sudden there's too much commotion. They just couldn't take it anymore. Um, I, th I think nobody got as far as actually filming, you know, for that yeah. to happen. You know, it happened quite a bit in the casting. You, you know, you, uh, you'd obviously have a very positive conversation with one member of the family. And, you know, then they have a, a discussion over mealtime and next day, the, the, you know, the message was very different to, to before. But, but I, you know, I think there was so much at stake that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't really afford to go with with, with, with anyone that was any, in any way not committed or flaky or the rest of it. And as I said, you know, the amount of paperwork and stuff you had to go through before you could go and film with people was was a huge amount. So the chances are they would have they would have had that moment, found it overwhelming long before we even turned up. Yeah. Um, and, and the casting teams were brilliant at being honest with people about what what it entails you know there was none of this oh it'll just be a few of us and it'll just take a few hours kind of you know the old tv yeah. Yeah. um you know uh, they were very honest with with them about what it you know what was required um so luckily i think we you know we we, we were fine i mean having said that there were days when the kids didn't want to play ball oh i can imagine and 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 that's you know there were lots of days like that and a kid who doesn't want to play ball there's not much you can do about that you know even if you're Mary Poppins. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's, that's like, well, we'll go and shoot something else. Leave them to it. Let them calm down, come back another day. Um, and I, but I think, you know, the, the hit rate was pretty good. We, you know, we, there's not a lot of stuff that we, that we filmed that we we're not ending up putting in the series. You know, we were very disciplined about what we needed and, you know, we knew what those, what those, all those points were. And, um, but, but but we all you know we would also say to directors look if you go out there and you see somebody if you see some first steps or you know if you're aware of that kind of coming about then then get it because the more we get that the more the, the better we can make that moment in the edit so people were great at getting extras as well above and beyond their ludicrous checklists they'd still, they'd also you know and, 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 and you know they're great directors are great like that aren't they they're like look this this kid's great, but there's a better kid down the road, and yeah. you know, can we hurry through some compliance stuff and and, and all of this, and and, and 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 very often we we would do that too, you know. How long was the entire series to film? Well, we filmed basically filmed for about two years, mm. um, and just finished filming before the pandemic that's what i was going to say i mean it's yeah you're so lucky you wrapped before yeah we were so lucky i mean it was a matter of weeks um we'd already we'd already been in the edit for quite a long time at that point because we filmed you know the, the the filming overlapped the edit by a long you know by a long period sure um but yeah we had to finish off the the end of offline and all of the online stuff and all of the po final post was done in in a world of c corona well, talk to me about the post-production process. Like how, you know, I, I can only imagine the massive amount of media that's coming your way. And yeah, so t tell me about the post-production. How did you have it set up? Well, it you know, we had to go with a very big facilities house who could deal with it. Hmm. You know, so we worked with the farm in London. There are, you know, I mean, London's a big place. And there's a lot of TV going on, but still there aren't that many people that can deal with a show like this. Um, and, uh, you know, they did a great job. I mean, I, I just think, what we probably underestimated was how long, you know, the amount of time working with that level of data 
yeah. was going to add to the add to the process. You know, we're we're all used to working with high def and things like that, but this was just another ball game. You know, it, just in terms of turnaround between rushes arriving, you know, cards arriving at the uh, the suite, and at what point they would be available to work within the edits. Yeah. You know, there's none of this. Can you have that in there by tomorrow morning? Business. Oh no. You know, it's it's days to to and process the data that you need on that information as you go through. And we, you know, we had dedicated teams doing that the whole the whole while. Um, and you said you were shooting 8K the whole time. Yeah, yeah, but we, but we, but we obviously we didn't edit. It, we compressed it down in order to do the offline and then brought it back up. Yeah. Um. In in the in the final post. Um, ah, just the yeah. media alone. This the the space yeah, you terrifying. need for this is unbelievable. I mean, I think you know, we, we yeah, we I, I, they kept running out of space. You know, we had to get more and more drives, and you know, you, nowadays you have as an exec, you get that terrible phone call from the facility, or, you know, or the, or the head of production says to you, "Look, we've got to think about deleting something." Oof. And you're like, "I'm not deleting anything." You know, I I I cut my teeth in the days of tape. Yeah. Nothing gets deleted. You know, this, that's a mugs game. Yeah, <laughs> we're not yeah. doing it. Get another drive. Yeah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, I honestly, I'm even surprised that that discussion ever comes up. Um, it just seems so yeah. crazy to me. But may, I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe, you know, I've been I've been in, in this for a while as well. And it just to me, it's insane to delete anything. But younger yeah. kids, you know, people that I'm working with in their 20s and they're just whatever they film it, they have the final version and they just delete it. I mean, it, yeah. maybe it's just a sea change that's happening. Yeah, I think I, I think it is. And I think it probably you know, it, 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 if you don't have a financial response to it, then you have to delete something. Yeah. But you, suppose, you sure have to be. Um, I mean, the thing is, everything's quite safe ultimately on LTOs as well. Sure. Because we put everything on LTOs, and, um, but uh, they're quite difficult to retrieve. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just you know the whole, the whole, the whole monstrous business. So, what was the makeup of your post production? And in, in our last few minutes, I just want to kind of get to the bottom yeah. of how you how you constructed these crews. Did you have like one team per episode, or how did you break it up? Yeah, we well, we had we put um, we had six suites, and each suite was doing an episode essentially, um, but they were staggered. So, we in the end, we 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 had uh, sort of a couple of finishing editors who'd done. The lot, you know, two big episodes for us, who would then jump on and kind of polish up some of the others. Um, so it was all, it was all like a staircase. But then you'd have the guys at the top going around at the end, and and and, and just putting a bit of sparkle dust on, you know, on, on the other episode based on what they learned over the sheer number of months. Um, but yeah, they, so they, we, we had a, you know, we had a sense of what the sort of what the layout of every story was and there was a timeline to follow obviously from birth through to 2000 days um but you know the stories morph at, when you get them in the edit and you realize that you can tell different things or you can tell a slightly more sophisticated story or that story just doesn't you know once you get it in once you look at what's on either side of it it doesn't really work so there was an awful lot of editorializing in the edit um and that was a lengthy process, mm. uh, and 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 also, you know, making sure that yeah, that Apple were happy with how things were, you know, at the right points, how things were were progressing, and you know, one runs the risk of showing people things a bit early, and you know, that's always a, as an exec, a bit of a conundrum at what point you sort of give them eyes on things, um, but I think by and large we sort of got that right, and and I think given that. The, Apple TV Plus was in such an embryonic state anyway, they wanted to be really involved, you know, and 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 look at stuff and be, you know, be in there. Jay at Apple was was, you know, it was very hands-on at times. And that was really welcome, you know, in, in to help us navigate that new world. You know, I mean one the thing I really love about working with Apple and and and, uh, you know, and Amazon and you know, it's that they they kind of the message to you is abandon your muscle memory about making TV and making something different. Oh, that's going to be so great to hear. Yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely. I mean, because the BBC and Channel 4 will tell you that, but in the sort of, on the anvil of the edit, it invariably ends up going back to what, you know, 
the BBC wants a program to look like and the rest of it. Whereas, the, you know, these guys, the message is, I don't want it to look like that. I don't want it to look like that. Yeah. Let's do something that feels fresh and, and, and interesting. And, um, and, and I think, you know, when I sit down and I watch these back, I do feel like they're really, I've not really seen anything like them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In terms of everything that they bring together. So I, I consider that to be, a, you know, a good achievement. It's quite hard to make things that feel fresh nowadays. And uh, I think we, you know, with Apple's help and encouragement, we, we got there. I certainly agree. And I think the, the, the show is just so beautifully shot. The content is really fresh. It's a different way of telling a story and a different story to tell. So congratulations. I mean, you guys did an amazing job. It's called Becoming You. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. It's available right now, all the episodes. And um, any last thoughts for our audience that may be, you know, aspiring producers, executive producers that kind of want to break into this industry? I mean, what what is the pathway in? Is there a pathway in? I, I, I Yeah, I think you, you really... I, I'm a great believer that you really have to work hard in this industry. I think there's a slight there's a slight thing at the moment because of all the outlets, anyone can make a film, you know, bloody blah, blah. But you know, just because you invent the pencil, everybody is not Shakespeare. And you know, there's a bit of a sense that you know I've just graduated from film school. You know, I'm Scorsese. It's like no, you're not. You know, what 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 you need to do is go and make the tea for two years and watch and learn. And I, I'm still a great believer in that as a discipline. You know, um, the BBC, which is where I cut my teeth, was full of older people and lots of attitude. And but there was but there was an absolute expectation of quality and an expectation of doing things properly and a certain way of doing things. And I'm not saying that rules aren't there to be broken, but I think coming into the industry, you need to be prepared to be watching people do what you want to do for a good number of years. And then if you do that, you will absolutely get what you want. You need to make yourself indisposable, don't you, in this industry? Mm -hmm. If you're young, go in there. Don't say, I've, I've got to go because... I've got a session at, at Equinox at seven o'clock. That session at Equinox doesn't exist anymore. You know, I don't want to sound like an old fart, but you need to really prioritize what you're doing because it just won't, re it won't resonate well with the people you're working with who, whether they're cameramen or sound men or, 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 or producers, men and women, they would have absolutely worked their socks off to get to where they're at. And don't ever underestimate that. I love that. I think those are very wise words and really helpful to the audience. And I, I, I think we thank you for that. That's really, really good advice. Hamo Forsyth, executive producer of Becoming You on Apple TV Plus. Thank you so much for coming on. That was really good information. And the show is fantastic. And I encourage all of you guys to watch it and love it and share it and tweet about it because it's a great show and a really good concept. And we thank Hamo for coming on. Thank you very much. All right, I want to thank Hamo for Scythe for coming on the show and talking to us about Becoming You, available now on Apple TV+. Plus. I mean, his stories are like nothing I've heard of when we talk to these documentary people. Like The way they did this is so different and certainly inspiring to me and I hope to you as well. So let us know in the comments what you thought of the episode. And if you have any questions for Hamo, you can send them our way as well. I want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for putting this whole show together behind the scenes. He's been working like an animal lately, getting these episodes out. We appreciate all of that. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. He and his team over at gainstructure.com make the show sound so delicious. And they can do the same for you if you want to hire them for your own video project. So check them out at gainstructure.com. Of course, follow us across social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode of Go Creative Show. And of course, all things Go Creative Show, including the show notes from this and every episode, available now at gocreativeshow.com. All right, that's it for today, but we're going to see you next week on the next episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.